So yesterday we began our discussion of uh, trigonometry, and uh, today we're going to evaluate some trig functions at certain angles. Uh, so let's do. I don't know, let's do four or five. But we saw that what mattered. Well, there were two things that mattered in evaluating trig functions. One, the quadrant that the angle lies in. Well, the quadrant that the angle brings you to. That's one part that matters. And then which trig function is being asked also matters. So let's do um, this one. Said, I think I wrote a few of my notes to do. Uh, let's do, we'll probably wind up doing six, seven, maybe at least. Uh, but for now, let's just do these three. Uh, that's backwards. Uh, let's see, where's the setting that tells you how to change? I think it's, it's a video setting. Okay, that, that should be a perfection. Um, so first we have here sine of pi over six. So how do we figure out which quadrant pi over six brings us to? Well, I like to use one of the diagrams on the trigonometry page, which I have somewhere. So the one middle right that has quadrants broken down by sine also tells you what angles correspond to the axes or um, tell us yeah, which angles the axes correspond to. This angle here is angle zero because we're going up no, we're going up nowhere from the positive x axis. Over here, we have a right angle, 90 degrees, brings us to pi over two. Over here, we have pi down here. 3 pi over 2, and then it starts repeating itself at 2 pi. So where does pi over 6 lie? Well, we can figure that out by looking at the coefficients of pi. So pi over 6, the coefficient of pi is 1 and 6. And the question we could ask is, between which two of these is 1 6 pi? Well, here we have 0. Here, the coefficient of pi is one half. And one sixth is between zero and one half. So that tells us that this is a quadrant one angle. Um, when you're doing these, so there, there are a couple on the homework, and there are a few different ways you could do them. I will go over, well, I'll write a little more detail than may be absolutely necessary um, for illustration purpose. Um, a first observation, before even noticing that we have a sine function here, our first observation will be that we're in quadrant one. Any questions about why that angle lies in quadrant one? So it's an angle that looks this because pi over six is between zero and pi over two. So what does that angle bring us into quadrant one? And remember, these quantities are technically not angles. They're technically pieces of the unit circle, but um, you know, angle is a two syllable word. Piece of the unit circle is more than two. So let's just say angles, that's fine enough. In the first quadrant, all trig functions evaluate to a positive number. But, well, so let's write that down. So this equals some positive, but it's positive what? Well, we can use 
either the unit circle or some convenient triangles to figure that out. We have on this trig page two convenient triangles. Um, in general, you know, if the coefficient on pi is a whole number, or if it's a multiple of a half, you'll use the unit circle. If it's um, not, you won't. And we won't see any that aren't. You know, the, the triangles have pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 4. Unit circle has pi over 2, whole number multiples of pi. Um, we're not going to see any others. You could evaluate some like a pi over 12 using some trig identities, but you know, that, that's not for a copy of scores. We'll stick with um, this. So we have pi over 6. That's going to tell us, let's look at the triangle, pi over 6 and pi over 3, the 30, 60, 90 triangle. These sides are in ratio 1 to root 3 to 2. We have sine, sine, pi over 6, we would use the opposite over the adjacent sine is opposite, or sorry, opposite over hypotenuse. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite of pi over 6 is 1, hypotenuse is 2. So we have positive 1 half here. Any questions about either of the two parts of finding this, the sine, the uh, positive or negative sine, and the uh, rest of the number? Okay, now technically, for you know, one like part A, you didn't have to go through the quadrant argument because that angle appears exactly in this triangle. Um, in general, um, I would recommend thinking about the quadrants while you're doing this. Um, next, cosine of 7 pi over 6. How can we do this? Well, first thing, Figure out which quadrant 7 pi over 6 is in. Um, 7 pi over 6. Well, the coefficient on pi there is 7 sixths. The coefficient of pi here is 0, 1 half. 7 sixths, it's a little more than 1. It's not between zero and one half. It's also not between one half and one. But seven sixths is between one and one and a half, which tells us this is a quadrant three angle. In quadrant three, tangent and cotangent are positive, so cosine is negative. Any questions about that part? Now, one of the things that this diagram and our triangles allows us to do is essentially, once we figure out the quadrant and interpret the quadrant, all we have to do is look at essentially the denominator and use that angle. So here we have a 7 pi over 6. Because of this analysis, we can just look at the fact that there's a 6 in the denominator, which tells us we can use the triangle where there's an angle with a 6 in the denominator. Cosine is what? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side here is root 3. Hypotenuse is 2. We have negative. Over two. Any questions about that one? Now we have tangent of two pi over three. And again, first thing I like to do is figure out which quadrant two pi over three is in. Coefficient of pi is two thirds. Well, two thirds is not between zero and a half, but two thirds is between a half and one. So two pi over three is between a half pi and one pi, which tells us that that angle is in quadrant two. 
in quadrant two, sine cosecant are positive, so tangent is negative. We know our answer is going to be negative. The only other thing we have to do is go to a triangle, since this is not on one of the axes. We have 2 pi over 3, so we can look at angle pi over 3. Tangent is what? Opposite over adjacent. The side opposite pi over 3 is root 3. The side adjacent to pi over 3 is 1. So we have negative root 3 over 1, and that simplifies to just negative 3. Any questions about those three? Well, neither of those three. If we have this on a test, do we have to like show all our work like that, or can we just like have it memorized like from the unit circle? Yeah, so there are other ways you could do these. Um, I, I, I can't memorize you know, a bunch of values. So um, if you learned these another way and can do these another way, you are certainly welcome to do that. Um, in the, I made the solutions for the worksheet yesterday. In those, I did do them like this. Um, but if you uh, have another way of doing them, there, there are multiple ways of doing trigonometry. So you're welcome to use whichever way you like the most. So do we have to show a whole bunch of work for how we got that answer? Or can we just write the answer since if we wanted, we can memorize these rules? Um, if that's how you know them, that's fine with me. So yes, uh, actually, no, that was an or question. Um, so if you can look at this and say negative root three over two without work, that's fine. Um, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So like, so basically the first quadrant is positive, the second and the third is negative and the fourth is positive. Um, well, that depends on which trait function that uh, you have. Oh, it depends. Okay. Yeah. So this diagram tells you in the first quadrant, all of them are positive. The second quadrant, sine and cosecant, you know, sine flipped around, is positive, and the rest are negative here. Tangent and cotangent are positive here. Cosine and secant are positive. So, you know, in part B, if we had tangent of uh, 7 pi over 6, the answer would be some positive number. Thank you. Any other questions before we do a couple more of these? Okay. Um, so in part C, we had a quadrant two answer where it was negative. Let's do part D is going to be quadrant two, where the answer would be positive. D. Post C and of three pi four e. Uh, let's do a cotangent. Uh, let's throw it in that quadrant. Um, seven pi over six, part f. Um, I guess we haven't done a secant, so we might as well do a secant. Secant of seven pi over four. Let's do part G. Uh, a little larger once we do D and F. So part D, cosecant three pi over four. Three pi over four, the coefficient of pi is three quarters. Three quarters is not between zero and a half. Three quarters is between half and one. This angle is in quadrant two. Cosecant is sine flipped around. In quadrant two, sine and cosecant are positive. So that tells us our answer is going to be positive. 
Well, next, we have 3 pi over 4. I'll jump to the triangle that has pi over 4. Sides and ratio 1. 1 to root 2. And of course, you know, this is a isosceles triangle. Um, so you could use whichever angle you want. Um, I'll use the bottom one, I guess. Uh, cosecant, what is the uh, fraction for, for cosecant? Well, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So cosecant is that flipped around. Cosecant of an angle is hypotenuse over opposite. So for angle pi over four, hypotenuse is two. Opposite is one. And positive root two over one does simplify. It's just uh, any questions about part D? Part E cotangent seven pi. Oh, I already asked one with seven pi over six, didn't I? I asked cosine of seven pi over six. Yeah, okay. Probably should have made it four pi over three. Well, we'll, we'll do this one since many of you probably already wrote it. Um, cotangent seven pi over six, seven pi over six. Coefficient on pi is seven six. Seven sixths is a little more than one. It's a little less than, well, it's a good deal less than one and a half. So seven pi over six brings us into quadrant three. In quadrant three, tangent is positive. So cotangent is also positive. What is the ratio for cotangent? Um, Well, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So cotangent is adjacent over opposite. Which angle are we using? Well, we have seven pi over six, so we can use this pi over six. The adjacent side to that pi over six is root three. The opposite side is one. So here we have positive root three over one simplifies to just root three. Any questions about that one? Okay, part F, secant seven pi over four. Coefficient on pi is seven fourths. What's seven fourths? Well, seven fourths is one and three quarters. So seven fourths is going to be larger than one and a half. Well, it is larger than one and a half, and it is less than two, which tells us we're in quadrant four. In quadrant four, cosine is positive. So secant, which is cosine flipped around, is also positive. The ratio for cosine is what? It is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the ratio for secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. The hypotenuse for angle pi over four is root two. The adjacent side is one. So we have positive root two over one, and this does simplify. Just root two. Any questions about that one? I guess that should be the same as part D. Plus a symmetry in that triangle. Um, so any questions about A through F? Okay. So let's do G. I'm actually going to put an H on here because there's one other thing I want to illustrate. So G, we have cosine of seven pi over two. We 
each. Let's do uh, cotangent of a Uh, so part G cosine of seven pi over two. Now with seven pi over two, this angle is not gonna lie in any of the quadrants because it is a whole multiple of pi or a half multiple of pi. If your angle is a whole number multiplied pi, multiple of pi, it's gonna lie on the x-axis. If it's a half multiple of pi, it will lie on the uh, y axis. So here we have cosine of seven pi over two. We know that's going to be either going up or going down. Now, to figure out which one, I generally like to get this angle between zero and two pi. Um, so you could count out to seven, seven halves, zero, one half, two halves, three halves, four halves, five halves, six halves, seven halves, and wind up down there. But you know, for larger numbers, uh, that might not be the best idea. But what we can do is use our relation that zero equals two pi as far as these angles are concerned. And we can take two pi off of this. Two pi is four pi over two. So seven pi over two without four pi over two is three pi. And now three pi over two brings us in uh, onto the negative y axis. What is the cosine? Well, the cosine, we'll take our unit circle. This point is what? Zero, negative one. Cosine is the x value, which is zero. Any questions about that? So last part H, we have cotangent of five pi over three. Cotangent of five pi over three. Where is five pi over three? Well, that's five thirds. Five thirds is one and two thirds. So we know it's larger than one. Is one and two thirds between one and one and a half? No, two thirds is larger than a half. So one and two thirds will be between one and a half and two. It's in quadrant four. In quadrant four, cosine and secant are positive, so cotangent is negative. The angle is five pi over three. So we can just look at this angle pi over three. We want cotangent. Uh, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So cotangent is adjacent over opposite. The side adjacent to pi over three is one. The opposite is root three. So we have here one over root three, and it's negative. And with this, um, you don't have to worry about removing the square root from the denominator. Square roots in the denominator, despite what you may have been told, are perfectly fine. Um, so you don't have to simplify that. Um, any questions about uh, any of these from A through H? One last thing about trig. Um, these angles are always going to be, well, positive angles always start on the positive x axis and go in the positive direction. Negative, negative angles are going to start at the same point but go in the negative direction. So 
right here, if we have an angle of theta, an angle of negative theta will be the same, but going in the negative direction. And we'll sometimes see negative angles. Um, and one way of dealing with them is you know, adding two pi until they're between zero and two pi. Um, for the most part, the negative angles we see will lie in either the fourth quadrant or on the negative y-axis. Um, so in this diagram, it may also be useful to keep in mind that three pi without one circle, three pi, or sorry, three pi over two without a circle, three pi over two minus four pi over two is negative pi over two. Um, and you could keep going around that this gives you negative pi as far as these uh, angles are concerned. Um, but it is, you know, we'll see negative angles a couple of times. Um, any questions about that? So um, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to talk a little about inverse functions. We're not going to talk too much about inverse functions, um, but we'll talk a little about them. And we'll see, uh, as we do calculus, we'll have a, a nice result on inverse functions. But first, let's define what we mean by an inverse function. Definition. Let. So the, I'm going to introduce some notation you've probably never seen before. Um, one way of writing a function. So a function takes a domain to a range. Now that's one way of defining a function. Um, another way of writing that is f, a function, colon, domain, arrow, range. So this function f takes a domain to a range. Um, it's a convenient notation. And we'll let this be a function. Well, yeah, let's define it first, then I'll talk about it. Let f with a negative one. So this is not f raised to the negative one, but it is written that way. Let f to the negative one notationally, but we read this f inverse. Let f inverse. take the previous range to the previous domain. And we're going to let this be the function that satisfies a convenient relation. And the relation is um, the important part of the inverse beta function for which. So we have inverse numbers. Now one, or sorry, two and one half are considered inverses of each other because two times one half brings you back to one. We have operations between functions. We could, you know, add functions, subtract functions, multiply and so on. But another relation, another operation on functions that we can do is composition. And the definition of the inverse function is going to use that composition. So an inverse function, the composition of the inverse and the original function evaluated at an x value is going to equal the same thing if you do the composition in the other order, the other order evaluated at an x value. And it's all going to equal x. So a function and its inverse. I don't like how that looks. I'm going to rewrite that. That's too notation. -y. Let's just say it like this for which 
F composed with F inverse equals F inverse composed with F equals just X. We don't need to write that. We validated that X. That's too much notation. So a function and its inverse, when you compose them, will always simplify to just X. Now, this relation has some nice properties. We're going to talk about one of them in a moment. Um, but it's a very important property for inverse functions. And the reason we call it an inverse function and the reason we give it this notation is because this simplification is very similar to, you know, solving an equation like this, 2x equals 5 multiplied by a half, you get x equals 5 halves. So right here, with multiplication, what we're doing is inverting the two. We're taking an inverse, and it allows us to solve, to simplify, so that we have only x. Inverse functions do the same thing, but with functions. Um, and we'll see an example of that in a moment. Well, right now, actually. And then we'll see a geometric interpretation. Um, so right here, let's just do an example. Find f inverse of x for this function. We're going to find f inverse, and we're going to show um, well, right here, we technically have two things that we could show. I'll show one of them, but the other is similar. Find the inverse function. Well, how can we do this? There is a standard way you can go about finding an inverse function for a function like this. And what you do, can do is you know, rewrite f of x as just y, and we can solve this for x. Maybe I'll write it on the other side. You take this and solve for x, you can find the inverse function. How do we solve this for x? Well, we can get rid of that 4. So we have y minus 4 equals 3x. We can get rid of that 3 by dividing. So x equals y minus 4 over 3. And once you solve this for x, you can find the inverse function by essentially replacing that y with x. And I don't want to squeeze it there, so I'll write it over here. We want to find f inverse of x. We can use that last equation to find it. Um, so we take this and just replace y with x. Now, there are other ways that you may see this done. You know, they, sometimes you see, you know, change this y to x, change this x to y. And solve for y. Um, uh, any questions about that? So let's show one of these relations. Um, so we'll show, I guess, the first one since the first one is written. I'm going to show f composed with f inverse equals x. You could do a similar computation showing the second one, f inverse composed with f equals x. But I'll show the first one and the other is similar. How do we do this? Well, we need f composed with f inverse. What is that written as just a function 
elevated somewhere else. Well, F composed with F inverse is F evaluated at F inverse. What is F evaluated at F inverse? We're going to take our original function F, which is here, and replace all X's with F inverse of X. F of X is 3X plus 4. So we have 3 F inverse of X. Plus four. Here, F evaluated at F inverse of X, take all X's and replace them with F inverse of X. In this function, there's this one X. We'll replace that with F inverse of X. Um, any questions about finding uh, this equation? So now we simplify this and it, it should simplify to x. It will simplify to x. Three divided by three is one. So you have x minus four. And then this positive four, and that does equal x. Um, as we expect, well, as it should be. Um, so any questions about that one? Now, let's um, do two things. Let's graph in the, for the same example. Let's sketch a graph of f of x and f inverse of x. Because the graphs are going to relate nicely. Let's sketch f of x is 3x plus 4, and let's sketch f inverse of x. And for this one, since we're sketching lines, um, I am going to use the slope-intercept form. Um, probably the only time this semester I use the slope-intercept form. Um, f inverse of x, just simplify this fraction. You get x over 3, which is a third x minus four over three, so we have third x minus four thirds. And let's sketch these. Uh, let's start with f. Y intercept of four, that's somewhere up here. Slope of three, so it's pretty steep. That's probably more than three. Yeah, that's steep. Uh, let's make that. So right here, y-intercept of 4, we have f of x. And it's a sketch. It's a, a rough sketch. Uh, the other one, f inverse, y-intercept, negative 4 thirds. That's somewhere down here. Slope of 1 third, so it's not very steep. So it could look something like that. And these two functions are related. How are they related? Well, I'll tell you how they're related. If you draw the line y equals x, the um, line going through the origin with slope 1, that line will intersect this function at those two points because f and f inverse are related by flipping over by flipping one over the line y equals x so if you take f and fold your page over uh, the line y equals x 
what you're left with is a graph of F inverse. And let's write that down. F and F inverse are symmetric about line Y equals X. And the um, relation for F inverse, you know, that composition relation, can be used to actually show this. Um, you know, that this is a geometric interpretation of the composition relation. Um, any questions about that? So in your sketch of these functions, line y equals x will go through that point. You know, if you were very careful in your slope and y-intercepts, um, you would find that. But you know, sketching graphs, you don't have to do that here. Let's uh, look at this a little more. So in the definition of inverse function, we assumed that the inverse was a function. But flipping a curve over the line y equals x may not necessarily be a function. Why? Well, let's look at one. Um, Let's do this two ways. Well, I could say fine. I'll say what about, so we did a few different things with the line uh, 3x plus 4. So we'll say here, what about f of x equals x squared? Meaning, what can we say about the inverse of this function? Well, as it turns out, we can't say much about the inverse of that function, but we can say something. And we'll say it in two different ways. First, we'll do an algebraic, meaning we'll follow the process we went through for the other one to find the inverse. Place f of x with y and solve for x. Notice what happens when you, yes, was there a question? No, okay. When you solve this for X, what do you get? Well, to solve that for X, you need to take a square root, but square root of Y, there are two different answers. There's the positive square root and the negative square root, which tells us that we can't solve this explicitly for x. I'll say two choices, you know, the two, or, yeah, two squared and negative two squared are uh, both four. So when you try to solve this for x, you can't solve it explicitly for x. We have two choices, which tells us that if we tried to find an inverse function, it wouldn't be a function because a function must have only one choice. So I'll say two choices. So we can't define the function f inverse of x because a function requires only one choice. Let's look at now the geometry. So I find for this one that the geometric interpretation, it's much easier to figure out what goes wrong with the geometric interpretation. Meaning, let's take our curve. We can sketch this curve. That's one of our standard curves. Here's f of x. 
And we want to flip that across the line y equals x. Flip it over the line y equals x. What would that look like? Well, we would take this, flip it over the line y equals x. Um, so with this, it, it may be useful to you know, draw it on paper and then fold your page over y equals x um, if you have foldable paper. Um, Yeah, so I realize all papers full, but I was thinking if online, if your page isn't attached to a notebook, I guess I should have said. But if you try to flip that over, the curve f inverse of x would look like this. And I'm going to throw a question mark there because why? Well, you flip it over, it gives you this curve. What goes wrong there? This right here is not a function. The definition of the inverse was that it had to be a function. Why is it not a function? Let's throw an exclamation point there. I don't like exclamation points much, but let's put one there. Why is it not a function? Well, if you didn't watch the first video on functions, you wouldn't know, but I'll tell you right now, in case you didn't, it's not a function because a vertical line hits it more than once. Um, more details on that in the uh, video from the beginning of this week. But it's not a function. A function can't have a vertical line hitting it more than once. So I'll say by vertical any questions about this? So algebraically, we can't find F inverse because we have multiple choices. And we can see that in the geometry um, when you have those multiple choices, the potential inverse curve does not define a function. Um, so any questions about that? So we can't find F inverse for this. So well, F inverse doesn't exist for this function. But what can we do to, what can we do to figure out some information about the inverse function? So I'll say we can still make some observations. That's uh, too many words to sentence I was going to write. We can still. I'll say, say something about F inverse of X. What can we say about F inverse of X? Well, let's force ourselves to have only one choice, meaning let's take only one of the positive or negative square root. How is that reflected in these graphs? Well, how is that reflected in these graphs? Picking only one of the positive or negative square root would tell us that we're forcing this to be a function. So I'll say we force the curve. I'm going to put force in quotes because we're technically not forging it. We force the curve f inverse of x to be a function. It'll, this will be more clear with the next diagram. We 
force for her to be a function. How can we do that? Well, a function must satisfy the vertical line test. Vertical lines must intersect the curve only once. What can we do to make that happen? Well, we have this entire curve. Let's take only one of the two pieces. Let's take If you take only, say, that piece, notice, maybe I'll draw a different color. Um, yeah, but I, if the boldness doesn't entirely show, maybe another color will show. Maybe boldness show. Is it clear that that's a different color on the screen? I can't really tell on this screen. Not really, we, we can see it. Okay. So however you want to see it, either different color or the fact that it's drawn much more full. Um, so on that curve, it's yellow or green, I think. Um, I'm actually colorblind, so this is probably yellow. There's green chalk also that would probably yellow. So notice on that top piece, the bold piece, notice the, let's say bold piece does satisfy the vertical line test. And I'll abbreviate that VLT, that's a lot of words. Um, that piece does satisfy the vertical line test, meaning if we take only that piece, we can define an inverse function. And you can say a similar thing for the bottom piece. But what does that look like in terms of our original function? Because our goal is to make an observation using the original function to determine whether an inverse function exists. Well, take this piece, flip it across y equals x. That corresponds to this piece, um, the bold piece of F, well, I'll say, uh, I'll say a B inverse, corresponds to the bold piece here. So putting all of that together tells us this curve, the inverse doesn't exist. So this is still technically part of that example. So I'll just uh, consolidate what we've just observed. So observe, F inverse doesn't exist for the original function on its original domain. So I'm going to say it doesn't exist on the domain of the original function, which was negative infinity to infinity. And it didn't exist from uh, either of the two observations. But we can take a piece of the domain on which F inverse will exist. And again, you could have chosen this bottom piece and that would correspond to that left piece. Um, but either way, we can restrict the domain of F of X so that F inverse of X exists. on that restricted domain. Well, I'll say using that restricted domain. So 
So on this restricted domain, what is F inverse? Well, where do I want to write it? I'll, I'll write it over here. Um, so this, I didn't organize this well. I went over there, then backwards, and back over here. But right here will be the uh, last part of this example. So technically, this is actually still another observation. So maybe I should pull up these. So as the third bullet, let's write F inverse. So by restricting the domain, it says, oh, that's a terrible call. By restricting the domain of f of x to what did we restrict the, the domain to? Well, we took this piece that's on zero to infinity, and we can include zero. So I'll include zero. So by restricting the domain of f of x to zero to infinity, we find on that restricted domain f inverse of x is what? Well, that would correspond to the positive square root because this piece is positive. Um, so if you restrict the domain to uh, negative infinity to zero, the inverse would be the negative square root. Um, any questions about that? Could you also just restrict the range of the inverse? Yes, you could. Um, yeah, I, I, I see what you're thinking, that they, they are essentially doing the same thing. You, you could, yes, the, the answer is yes. You could do the same thing working with the range of the inverse, forcing this to satisfy the uh, vertical line test. Um, in math, in general, I mean, so I, I'm technically a mathematician and I've been doing math for like 10 years. Um, it's just more common to work with domains. So I more instinctively work with domains. Um, so just for this, you can use just the range. Um, but our next result is gonna be, one of the goals was to, we started this example given a function. And it would be nice, given a function, to immediately jump to, does the inverse exist? Um, so having a property on the original function that allows you to make your conclusion um, would probably be one step fewer. Um, but you can work with the range. That's sort of, you know, restrict the domain, or restrict the range of it, that curve to zero to infinity. Um, any other questions about this? So that was a, a pretty long process we went through to reach conclusions about F inverse. Is there a way we could have done that faster? Well, usually when you get asked that, the answer is yes. Although sometimes it isn't. Let's look at those two curves again. So I'll, I'll say it sir. Um, this is technically not part of that previous example. Um, that's terrible. Let's look a little more carefully at what went wrong. And let's, again, let's say this over here is F, and this is a potential F inverse. Let's look more carefully at what went wrong for this inverse. What went wrong for this inverse was that it didn't satisfy 
the vertical line test, meaning it wasn't a function because it didn't satisfy the vertical line test. Is that somehow reflected by the graph of the original function? Well, what happens if you flip this vertical line over the line y equals x? Let's see, do I have a model that can do that? Maybe. If you look at this vertical line, say the side over here, flip it across the line y equals x, look only at this side, what happens? It becomes horizontal. It didn't become perfectly horizontal because this isn't a square. But if you flip this across y equals x, that vertical line becomes horizontal. So notice, I'll write this as a, an observation. Well, I already wrote the word observe. If uh, a vertical line hitting a potential F inverse curve or let's just say twice for this example. In general, more than once, let's just say twice is fine. A vertical line hitting a potential. The reason I say potential is because this technically isn't an, an inverse, because it's not a function. A vertical line hitting a potential F inverse curve twice is reflected. Reflected to, we already used the word reflected, is exhibited by a horizontal line intersecting f of x twice. A vertical line hitting the curve twice, meaning when this isn't a function, we're going to have, when this potential F inverse curve isn't a function, we're going to have a horizontal line intersecting the original function more than once. And this observation is a theorem. We'll call it the horizontal line test. Um, I think in the uh, first video I wrote it like this, so I'll write it like this. The theorem horizontal line test. Horizontal line test. Let's use the phrasing I wrote because I want it to sound the same as the vertical line test. For a function f the inverse function f inverse exists if and only if each horizontal line intersects F, no more um, So the phrasing here is very similar to the phrasing for the uh, vertical line test. Um, any questions about that? And one um, before, you have questions. Um, now, one of the nice things about this is that 
it really ties together in the beginning of this week to uh, what we're doing now. Um, because the horizontal and vertical line tests, but not only are they called something similar, they actually show very similar properties in uh, these graphs. Um, so you know, I, I'm not, I have in the past, I'm, I'm not this semester going to ask a question that says, like relate the vertical line test and the horizontal line test, but it is definitely very useful to know. Um, but I, I am not gonna ask one like that. Um, any questions about that? I mean, I may ask you to use it, but I'm not gonna ask the specific question, explain how they're related, why they're related, draw something that shows you. Um, any questions? I'm just, you know, in case it seems like I'm always looking over there, that's because I'm in a classroom here and the board is here, but the uh, projection screen is over there. So um, that's really to make sure the screen looks proper. Um, any questions about that? So we could go into inverse trig functions. So you know, in the first video, we went over the graphs of the trig functions. Um, and in it, the graphs of the free trig functions, none of them satisfy the horizontal line test. But we can do something similar to this. What we did here using the horizontal line test is we restricted the domain of our original function so that the horizontal line test was satisfied. Um, and the, the previous question about the range, um, you know, part of my hesitation in my answer is because I, I didn't want to mention this, but that, that was another reason I uh, was thinking in terms of the domain. Because um, you know, to figure out if an inverse function exists, you, know, you usually don't go through all that. You just uh, force the horizontal line test to be satisfied um, for the original function. Um, but for any function, you can restrict the domain um, until an inverse function exists. And you could do that with uh, the three, well, actually all six of the trig functions. Um, we won't, where did I put my notes? We won't uh, do that. We're actually um, in week six. I'm probably going to mention something about the inverse trig functions, but um, they will not be tested at all. But we will, in a two or three weeks, see uh, another result using the inverse function, um, a calculus result on the inverse function. Next, let's talk about exponential functions and logarithms. An exponential function. So exponential functions. An exponential function uh, well let's do one of these charts as values to see these with two to the x. So we'll take x values and we'll let our y's equal two to the x. And let's take a, a few numbers to see what this looks like. X equals zero, two to the zero, one x equals 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, x equals 2, 2 to the 2 is 4, let's go up to 5, x equals 3, 2 to the 3 is 8, x equals 4, 2 to the 4 is 16, x equals 5, 2 to the 5th is 32. And let's uh, sketch this curve. Well, we have zero, one, that's right here. One, two, two, four. That's a little high for four. That's actually a little high for one. Uh, uh. Let's put two 
two one a little closer to the x axis. Or zero one. Zero one, one, two, two, four, three, eight, four, sixteen, five, thirty-two is way up above the board, which I, I guess you can technically see. It's you know almost toward the ceiling. Let's attach these. Two to the x on zero to the infinity looks something like that. Notice it goes up, but it goes up very, very quickly. And that type of growth is called exponential growth, and it's exhibited by exponential functions, a function where our variable x is our exponent. Now, what happens on the other side of zero? On the other side of zero, I guess I'll do another chart. What do we get? Negative one, let's do negative one, let's do four. Two to the negative one. Well, what do negative exponents do? Negative exponents take you from a numerator and put you in the denominator. Two to the first is two, so two to the negative one is one over two. Two squared is four, so two to the negative two is one over four. Two cubed is eight, so two to the negative three is one over eight. Two to the fourth is 16. One over two to the fourth is uh, one sixteen, and so on. But notice all of these are positive. Well, all of these are positive, I should say. Meaning this curve is always going to be above the x axis. But notice also, as x keeps getting more negative, these values keep getting lower. But they stay positive. So the rest of this curve is going to look like that. It's going to go down toward the x axis. Any question? Uh, I'm also going to mark off zero one. Any questions about that sketch? Let's define exponential functions a little more formally. Well, before that, observe, you can do some graph transformations with these. You know, you could do, you know, you can add numbers to it. You can flip over x axis with negatives. You can shift in any of the directions. Um, I don't think any of that's actually going to show up at all this semester. But with that general exponential curve, you can um, apply some graph transformations. Um, debate if I want to define these formally. Um, no, I'm actually not going to define it formally yet. I'm going to do something else first. What if I didn't make it two to the x? What if I made it? I'll leave this two. What if I made it just some number to the x? What about? The curve y equals b to the x, where let's just restrict ourselves to positive, where b, let's also make it large enough one. One to the x is just the line y equals x. What about the curve y equals b to the x, where b is larger than one? What would that look like? Well, if you picked values like this, at zero, you would still get uh, b to the zero, so you would still get zero, one. But at one, you would get what? b at two, b squared, b cubed, and so on. But what's important, um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I have chalkboard, but in your notes, um, I would recommend drawing a second graph after this question. In general, an exponential function where the base 
is a number larger than one and the exponent is our x, goes through the point zero one, grows very quickly in the positive direction, goes down toward the x-axis in the negative direction. Um, so I would recommend drawing that after this question. Uh, generalize that previous example. Um, but notice, well, very important, it goes through zero one. Um, that is actually going to show up several times this semester in a couple different contexts. The fact that that goes through zero one. Um, more on that in a moment. But let's notice a couple things about this. Notice. Where do I want to notice it? Let's notice it here. Well, first, notice it is a function by the vertical line test. But notice f of x equals b to the x is not only a function, but it satisfies also the horizontal line test. And abbreviate HLT if you want. Notice it satisfies the horizontal line test, meaning every horizontal line will not hit it more than once. What does that mean? Well, this means that the inverse function exists. So F inverse of X exists on the entire domain. And what does that look? I'm seeing if my sentence is going to fit here. Uh, yeah, okay, this, the sentence will fit there. I'm going to write one more sentence, but I'm going to do something on this graph. F inverse exists. What does it look like? Well, let's see what it looks like. Here's the line y equals x. Flip that over the line y equals x. This point, zero, one, is now going to move over here to one, zero. And the rest follows accordingly. This piece, I guess that should be really a little closer. It should be more symmetric than I drew. Uh, one, zero is here. One, zero is there. This piece in the negative direction will go down here. This piece in the positive direction will go up there, like that. So right here, we have F inverse of X. Any questions about the curve? F inverse of X. This curve shows up frequently. It's a very important curve. Um, more on that in a moment. But since it shows up so frequently and since it is so important, we call it something else. We denote F inverse of X. I'm going to go on to this other board um, so that the math stays on one line. We denote F inverse of X log of X with a b down there. So for a general exponential b to the x, we denote its inverse, the logarithm of x with base b, like that. So this curve over here is log x with base b. And then maybe I should say we call it, and we say, uh, logarithm of x with base b. Or you could say the logarithm of base b of x or whatever. Um, but we call it a logarithm function. A logarithm function is defined to be the inverse of an exponential function. 
Any questions about that? So logarithms and exponentials have a few nice properties. Um, before getting into those, how can we use these? Example, solve each for a. Um, does anybody, is anybody still copying this graph? I'm gonna, I wanna erase it for this example. Does anybody not want me to erase that graph? Example, solve these three for X. Two times X equals five. I'm gonna write the solution underneath. Two to the X equals five. Part C, log X with base two equals five. So solve these three for X. First one, two times X equals five. Well, first we'll notice in all cases, we have twos preventing us from having already solved these for X. In the first case, we have two times X equals five. To remove that two, multiply everything by a half. Two times a half is one. Five times a half, a half is five halves. In part B, two to the X equals five. We have a two preventing this from being solved, but here the X is in the X one. So what we want to do is invert that exponential. And we can use a logarithm to invert an exponential. So in this first case, all we had to do was use multiplication. And that allowed the two to go away. But here, we can't use a multiplication. We need to get rid of an exponential function, which we can do by taking a logarithm. The base is two over here. The logarithm base two of the left side is X. The logarithm base two of the right side is the logarithm of five with base two. Any questions about part B? In the third case, we have a logarithm function with base two. To get rid of a logarithm function, we're gonna use its inverse. The inverse of the logarithm is an exponential. The base is two, two to the left side is X. Two to the right side, is two to the fifth, which in this case simplifies to 32. So X equals 32 over here. Now another way of seeing the logarithm is you know that this base to this number equals that X. Um, so you can't think of it like that. Um, but it's definitely nice to relate these three. Because um, in all cases, we're doing one step to solve for X. We're getting rid of a two, and there are three different ways we could do that. Any questions about that one? So next, let's talk a little about the exponential and logarithm properties. Um, so I posted a, a document on Canvas some of what I'm about to say, you know, the one called log logarithms. And the logarithm and exponentials are very related. So the exponential properties have parallel logarithm properties. And the, the first half of that document is discussing 
derivations for the exponential properties. Um, what letters did I use there? A, B, and C. Uh, and I used A and B. Okay, so I should use the same letters here. Now I'm not going to remember them. So exponentials, if you look at that first uh, table we did with the twos and the two to certain numbers, exponentials count how many twos you're multiplying together. Two to the fourth is two times two times two times two, four twos. Exponential properties, part a, or no, I should say one. Um, reason A. One. A to the B. A to the C. A to the B times A to the C. A to the B. is B copies of A, multiply the other. A to the C is C copies of A. So over here, we have B copies of A. Over here, we have C copies of A. How many A's are there? Well, we have B and we have C. So in total, we have B plus C copies of A. So one exponential property is that a to the B, A to the C equals A to the B plus C. Any questions about that one? Okay. Second, A to the B raised to the C. What does that look like? Well, A to the B, remember, is B copies of A sitting next to each other multiplied. So we have that. C times. So we have B copies of A, we have B copies of A, we have B copies of A, C times. So in total, we have B copies of A, C times, which gives us a total of B, C copies of A. And with an exponential, B, C copies of A can be written A to the B, C. Now, exponentials just count how many things are multiplied together. Any questions about that? Um, did I mention anything about negative exponents in this type? Oh, yeah, the 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 third to last line of the logarithm document, I mentioned negative exponents. But remember, a negative exponent just takes something in the numerator and moves in the denominator. And I will record that as an exponential property because um, it does show up many times throughout the semester. So a to the negative, I'm going to use x here. a to the negative x is just the fraction 1 over a to the x. Um, so when you see a negative exponent, um, so first of all, if you have a negative exponent in your answer, you don't have to simplify it. So many times you know, in high school math, they say, get rid of negative exponents, or they say, use only negative exponents or something like that. Um, in this class, they're fine either way, whichever way you want to write them. There are going to be some things we do throughout the semester where we need to to find something and then use it to do other things. And in that doing other things, it may be useful to write it as a fraction. Um, and we'll see that later on. But for now, it's very useful to keep in mind that negative exponents just flip things around on the fraction. Um, any questions about that, about those exponential properties?
So there are parallel logarithm properties. And in the document, I think I call it logarithms. Um, I believe I prove two of them. And then the third is just because of the negative exponent. Well, for the second, it's the negative, yeah. So I, I do show proofs. I'm not gonna ask you proofs, but you know, if you ever wanted to know why these are true, well. So first, logarithm of a product is the logarithm of the first plus the logarithm of the second. And in this list, I'm not going to specify the base of the logarithm. This will work for any base. Well, the only bases for which logarithms defined are larger than one. Um, but this will work for any base. So I'm, in that case, just not going to write the base. The second logarithm property is that the logarithm of a quotient splits into a difference. So logarithm of the first minus the logarithm of the second. So logarithm of a product becomes a sum of logarithms. Logarithm of a quotient becomes a uh, a negative sum, a difference of logarithms. And last, logarithm of an exponential. What letter did I use? I think I used R. No, I used B. Usually people use R for this. Logarithm of A to the B. This exponent comes out front and you multiply it. B times the logarithm of A. And all three of these properties work regardless of base. Any questions about those properties? Um, so let's see what we can do with those properties. Well, there are a few things we can do. Uh, let's solve a couple equations first. We'll use logarithm. Solve this equation for x. Logarithm. Here I'm going to use base ten of root x plus logarithm of just x with base 10 is 2. So try and solving this for x. Take a moment and try to solve it for x. There are actually two different ways you could go about solving this. Um, so try uh well try them try this and see how you go I'll, I'll start working on it in about 20 seconds i'll say but there are two ways it can be done So first, you can use that first logarithm property and turn it into logarithm of x times root x. And then you'd have to use property free. I'm going to do it another way. And uh, of course, you do get the same answer. 
I'm going to observe that this square root of x can be written as x to the one half. And then we can apply property three. By property three, this first piece is a half times logarithm of x with base 10. The rest will leave alone. So half logarithm of x with base 10 plus log x with base 10 equals 2. And how do we solve this? Well, here, well, any questions about using property 3 in that first step? Now, how do we solve this? Well, we have a half of something plus one more of that thing. If you have half of something and one of something, you have one and a half of those things, also known as three halves. Three halves logarithm of x with base 10 equals two. Now, how do we solve this? Well, we can move the three halves to the other side by multiplying the left and the right by two thirds. Two thirds times the left is logarithm of x with base 10. Two thirds times the right is two thirds times two, which is four thirds. And then to solve this, we have a logarithm function. To get rid of a logarithm, we'll take an exponential. 10 to the, the base is 10. So 10 to the left side is x. 10 to the right side is 10 to the 4 thirds. Any questions about that? You could, I guess, if you want to write that as what cube root of. 10,000. Um, any questions about that one? So the other way you could have solved this, I'll just start it. I'll just say alternatively, what could you have done? Well, using property one on the first line, you would get logarithm of x to the three halves equals two because x times root x by exponential property one is x to the one half, x to the one, which is x three halves. And then from here, property three of logarithms would get you there, and then you'd solve the same way. Um, so e either way, of course. Um, any Questions about uh, that one. So logarithms can have any base larger than one. Um, there's one base which, in many ways, is more important. In calculus, especially, there's one base which is far more important than all other bases. Let's just make this as a remark. Remark. Uh, how should I say? Let's say it. There is an important number called lowercase e, which is approximately equal to two point seven one. How many did I wrote eight afterwards? 2.718 ish. And it's a very important number. Um, well, actually, it shows up in all branches of you know, science. Um, in calculus, we will see uh, several times why this base E is more important and it is more convenient and uh, shows up more in calculus than the other bases. Um, but there's an important number E. Oh, yeah, okay, there's an important number E. Logarithm of x with base E 
shows up so frequently in math that we call it something else. This right here, that has five letters. That's a lot of letters. But there's an abbreviated way of writing it in math, ln of x. So if you see ln of x, the assumption is a logarithm function with base e. The logarithm with base e is written like that and is called the natural logarithm of x. That I should put the quotes after natural logarithm. It's called the natural logarithm of x. And uh, let's just look at a quick example of solving one, please. Solve for x log of 1 over x equals 4. Solve this for x. Well, we could use our logarithm properties. I guess the first one is I'm going to use a logarithm. You could use an exponential property. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to get rid of the logarithm first and then uh, handle that. To get rid of a logarithm, we take an exponential. The base is e. e to the left side is 1 over x. e to the right side is e to the 4. Solve this for x. So what, multiply both sides by x, divide by e to the fourth, or just flip both sides around. So x equals one over e to the fourth. Of course, you could say e to the negative fourth. Any questions about uh, anything we just discussed with logarithms? Um, so to this point, um, we did a pretty quick review of a lot of different functions, but nothing we did was calculus. It was all either algebra or pre-calculus or trigonometry, but none of it was calculus. Let's start calculus. This semester in calculus, the calculus we'll see, can be broken down essentially into three parts. We have limits, we have derivatives, we have integrals. The latter two, derivatives and integrals, are limits. So we'll start with limits. We'll see a few things we can do with this thing called a limit. And then we will get into derivatives, which are also limits and integrals, which are technically also limits as well, even though it may not seem like. So what do we mean by limit? Well, we'll see probably five or six different things we could mean by limit, uh, especially next week. We'll be doing pretty much only limits. Um, but let's first debate if I want to define it first or if I want to write an example first. Uh, let's define it first, and then let's look at some examples. Limits. Uh, this definition is going to be pretty long. Um, now it's going to be pretty long. Maybe I'll try abbreviating it a little. Let
let f of x be a function and let L, capital L, be a real number. all values of f of x approach capital L as the values of x approach A. And we'll see what we mean by approach uh, after this definition. Um, I'm not going to fit the rest of that here, so I'm going to have to go over here. Yeah, I think that should be enough for an example. Then we say Uh, limit. This is all going to fit here. Yeah, this all fit here. Limit of f of x as x approaches a is l. Say equals l. So if all values of f of x approach l. As the values of x approach a, then we say the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l. A lot of words, so we have abbreviated notation, and we write lim l i m limit of f of x as x approaches a. We write that as x with an arrow and an a underneath the limit is l equals l. Any so we are going to illustrate that definition with a couple examples but any questions about uh, that definition so here I'm going to draw a function there's a function we'll call it f let's mark off a point Uh, let's say that's x equals 4. Let's say that's y equals 3. So that point is 4, 3. And that, that's the only point I'm going to mark off on. We have a function. Um, after this example, I'm going to have to erase that definition. So um, take a, uh, I'll pause a moment and write it, but we'll still be able to get through everything. Does that color show up as a different color on screen, or does that? It's blue. Okay. Uh, is it like really obvious that it's blue? Well, is it really obvious that it's different than white? I should say. To me, it is. Yeah. Um, so I could do this. Which one of these is most obviously different from? So I, I, I'm not asking which one is it easiest to tell which color it is. Which one looks the most different from white? Uh, 
So we'll call it one, two, three, four, five. Which looks most different? And you can just uh, yell out your answers. Either one or five. Uh, one or five. Does anybody? I agree with that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Okay. So what was that? That was this color and this color. I think that's blue and red. So I'll take these other three and move them here. Okay, thank you. Oh, red, white, and blue, that works well. Memorial Day was what, like three days ago? You have a test on Flag Day. Works out perfectly. Where did I put the white chalk? Over here. Okay, so we say the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l, and we write this. So here we marked off one point. Our L value, well, let's look a little more at this definition. Let F be a function, let L be a real number. If all values of F of X approach L. So right here, we're looking at the Y values. If all Y values, remember F of X evaluates to a Y value. So if the Y values of this function approach some number as the x values approach some other number, potentially other number, then we say the limit and so on. So the first observation we make is that this part of our notation, the x approaching a, takes care of what happens on the x-axis, and the function having a limit of l takes care of what happens on the y-axis. First observation. Um, well, any questions about that? Okay. So the next thing it says is if all values of f of x approach L as the values of x approach A. So here, the only marked off x value is four. So how many different ways are there on the x-axis of approaching four. How many ways can we approach four? Well, we can approach four from over here. We can approach four from that side. That's one way of approaching four. We can also approach four from this side. Is this red? Can, can you tell if that's red or is that like? It's red. I really should have made the right one red and the left one blue. I guess I'm going to do that. That, that, that should, uh, should be red. It's example. Since we have a left and right side, why not? Okay. So there are two different ways we can approach our x value for. And the limit says, if all values of f of x approach L as the x values approach, in this case, four. So what does our function do as these x values go to four? Well, let's look on this side first. What does our function do on this side of four? Well, the function goes down like that. It approaches, in that case, y value three. But the limit will exist and it'll be some number if that happens for all different ways we can approach four on the x-axis, meaning for this way and that way. So what happens as the x values approach, what happens to the function as the x values approach four from the left, from that side? The function looks like that on that side of four. And in this case, we look back at our definition, if all values of f of x approach L as x approaches here four, well, do all values of f of x approach 
a number as x approaches four? Well, yes, they do. No matter which way we get to four, the function is going toward this point, which has y value of three. So here, the limit as x approaches four of our function equals three. And we saw that by looking at all different ways we could approach four. Any questions about that one? Well, I think we have time for one more. What about this one? Draw a function like this. Let's put a hole on the function. Uh, what happens to this function? Well, we still have only two ways of approaching four. We have this way of approaching four, and we have this way of approaching four. What does the function do as the x values go to four? Well, on this side, the function approaches that open dot. On this side, the function approaches that open dot as well. So what is the limit in this case? Well, the limit says all that matters is what happens as x approaches this y value. So here, the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x is what? Well, I will tell you it is not 5. The limit does not care what happens at this x value. f of 4 does equal 5. But the limit only cares what happens close to 4 on both sides of 4. And on both sides of 4, the function approaches uh, that x value of 3. So I'll say f the limit equals 3, and I'll just say at the bottom, even though f of 4 equals Any questions about that example? Um, so that, that'll be where we stop. So four limits, you know, looking especially at this one is very useful for um, you know, an introduction to limits. So sometime before our, well, really before the, the next video, um, it's probably a good idea to look a little more closely at that and be sure that you're observing the limit pairs only what happens near the given x value. Um, any questions about anything we've covered today? We have a quick question about the homework. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, I heard you. I heard two people talking, so uh, I couldn't tell who that. If one of you has to go more quickly, then. Uh, well, if one of you doesn't have to go more quickly, then you can ask yours second. Um, well, okay, were both questions about the homework? Yeah, I was wondering, like, this is the one that says homework and worksheet. Are we doing the worksheet or are we just doing the packet that just says homework? Oh, uh, yeah, just, just the homework is to be submitted. The worksheet, I'm actually going to post solutions for. I, okay. I wrote an email tomorrow morning. Um, I'm going to post them later tonight at like nine or something. Okay, thank you. Homework, submit that. The worksheet is just uh, for you to work on. Um, is there another question? Uh, how are we supposed to turn in the homework? Is there going to be a spot in Canvas to do that? No, uh, you can just uh, take pictures or scan images and email it to me. Um, okay. I don't, I, I actually don't like Canvas very much. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but it, whenever you log on to Canvas, you have to like, have your
your phone and it sends you a code. You know, that doesn't always happen with email. So 